Welcome to the step-by-step -step tutorial for my painting Fall Foliage. This is a narrated step-by-step -step tutorial where I'll walk you through the development of the painting. This is a companion video to my demonstration video of Fall Foliage where you can view the evolution of the painting at 3x speed set to music. Before I start painting, I'm going to take a few moments to review some of the materials that I use. This is a ceramic palette that has 30 colors. I keep my wells full and I keep my palette clean. Many people don't like to clean their mixing area or their palette. They let it go for months or even years uh, working off the residue paint, which is fine if that's what works for them. I choose to keep my mixing surface clean. In fact, I clean it several times throughout the course of a painting. While I have 30 different colors on my palette arranged from warm to cool, there's really about 8 to 10 that I use more frequently than the rest. I've identified the colors that I use to accomplish my painting fall foliage starting from the top right. Holbein Royal Blue, American Journey Mauve, Daniel Smith Quinacridone Coral, American Journey Elizabeth Crimson, Daniel Smith Quinacridone Gold, American Journey Yellow Ochre, and Holbein Sap Green. I use a mixture of brands as you can tell. I have quite a collection of brushes as do many, but there's a few of my favorites and these are the ones that I use to accomplish this painting. Starting from the bottom is a silver black velvet jumbo round small 325 series. It's a very nice brush for uh, washes it has a little bit of a point but it's very soft and you can uh, easily glaze and put very nice washes on with it. The brush in the middle is a black gold quill series 311. It's a mid medium sized brush but it comes with a very fine point and you can do quite a bit of detail work with it. Above that are a couple Escoda Reserva. I have a number of these brushes. Uh, ranging from small to large. It's a very nice, uh, very high quality brush just for good general painting, painting. Brushes can be quite an investment so I do what I can to take care of them. Whenever I buy a new brush I take a little bit of clear nail polish and put it right at the point where the handle enters the ferrule. This helps seal that area and prevents water from getting in and causing the brush later to rot and become loose. The other thing I do is I always lay my brushes flat. I never stick the uh, brush upward in the air where water can come down into the ferrule again, rot the brush and, and make it loose. So I do what I can to take care of my uh, equipment. This is a fine mist spray bottle by Atelier that uh, is designed for use with their acrylics, but I find it works very well with watercolor. It's one of the finest mist sprayers that I've used, and it does a good job diffusing color and softening edges. I have other spray bottles which have a coarser spray, and they're great for adding texture, but um, I find that this bottle works very well for me in my painting process. I've decided in advance that I want to preserve some of the long linear shapes so that I can put washes over them and keep the white of the paper. So to do that, I have decided to use a fine line masking fluid pen. My reference for this painting is nothing more than a handful of leaves I went outside and pulled off the tree. I drew a few branch shapes and then started putting it in leaf shapes using the leaves that I had picked for reference. You can see by the blue tinted masking fluid where I have applied masking uh, using a fine line masking pen. I also took a toothbrush with some liquid mask and splattered it to give me a little bit of texture. So this is what I've done to prepare the surface. And now that I have my sketch and I've prepared my paper with masking fluid, I'm ready to paint. I'm working on 140 pound cold press Lanacora watercolor paper. It's a paper that I've worked on for quite a while that I really enjoy working on. I like the brightness of the paper and the ability to do some moderate lifting. Mm -hmm. 
now I'm starting to lay in my foundation wash, which will become my Teller Roadmap as I have developed this painting. You can see that uh, it's a fairly loose wash. I'm not really trying to paint around edges so much. Uh, I'm trying to get just a foundation wash down that will help give some unity to this painting as it evolves. After I lay this color in, I'm going to come in with a spray bottle and soften the edges and help diffuse the color a little bit more across the whole paper. This is going to help to tie this whole thing together as the painting develops. One of the things I want to be careful of as I do this and as the painting develops is there needs to be a dominant color. You don't want equal parts of everything. That makes for an uninteresting composition. So as I develop this, I'm going to make sure that uh, one of the colors in uh, cool or warm is more dominant than the other. These are very fluid washes I've put down and then I've sprayed on top of them with a fine mist sprayer. So this creates um, a very wet surface and lets water start to pool around the painting, especially when I have some of this masking fluid on the paper. When this starts to occur, you want to take a damp brush and just touch it to the paper in the area where the water is pooling and it'll pick the water right up. This will help you avoid unwanted backwashes in your composition. So for my approach, I lay a foundation wash and then I start to come in and build my values. And I do a lot of negative painting as I do this. One of the things I try to do early is decide where I want my center of interest. And I'll start to build my values in that area first and in the end those are going to be some of my strongest value contrast changes of color more activity and more detail it's going to be less so as the further you get out from my center of interest you you don't want everything to be the same so um, you need to have areas for the eye to rest you don't want the same level of detail in every square inch of the painting that starts to get busy and doesn't really lend itself to good design. You want to have uh, a center of interest, you want to have big shapes, small shapes, you want to have areas for the eye to rest. So now you can see I'm starting to paint around the leafy shapes that I drew. Um, and I'm also following the foundation wash in terms of the color changes that I'm making. So there's areas that are a deep red or a deep purple that are very similar in value but I've changed the color as I have moved across the paper into the different areas and I'm using my initial foundation wash kind of as my roadmap. I believe we're used to thinking positive when it comes to shapes. We're used to thinking about objects and when we try to paint objects we have a natural tendency to paint the object and not worry so much about the space between the objects. I like to create a balance between working positively and working on the interior edges of an object and working in negative space or working around the exterior edges of the objects. The further this painting develop, you'll start to see the leaf shapes and the branch shapes start to come forward without really a lot of rendering on the object themselves. They're starting to stand out because of the deeper values or color changes that are going on on the exterior edge of the object. Another thing I do is I try not to tell the whole story. I try to leave some of it up to the viewer's interpretation. And I do that by creating lost and found edges, softening edges. So when I go along the edge of an object, I don't necessarily want to follow the whole contour. 
It's just little suggestions of a value stopping at an edge, which helps give validity to the object. I continue to build my values. They get darker and darker as I go and get a little bit more detail as I go. And you can see I also have a number of color changes as I paint and as I work around the surface. I still use my foundation wash as my roadmap for the most part, although there are times when I deviate because I decide that I need to put a little bit more of a color in an area or um, I have too much of a balance going on and I want to create a little bit more dominance with a color and I'll bring a little bit more of that in. It takes a while to develop a painting, as most of us know, and it can get very long in a video when it's at normal speed and you're working uh, continually to try and develop this painting to a, a finished piece. So one of the things I've decided to do is to create two versions of my video. Uh, I'm experimenting with that. So I have the uh, narrated tutorial, which we're watching right now, and then I've created a um, demonstration video, which is at three times normal speed, and it's set to music. So what I like about the uh, sped up demonstration version is it doesn't require near the time commitment, and you can watch the painting evolve from start to finish in a much shorter time. The downside is you don't get the benefit of um, the narration and what I was thinking when I was doing something or learn about my materials. So for me it's uh, an approach I'm experimenting with but people are trying to get different things out of a video I feel. Some are really trying to understand it so that they can maybe take some pieces to use themselves and others just enjoy watching something like uh, a time-lapse video or a sped up video and just watching a painting evolve. So I'm continuing to build my values and as I do this you start to see the development of the leaf shapes uh, become more pronounced. So when, when you look at my process and how I approach a painting like this is I begin with the foundation wash then I build my values and start to develop the painting uh, normally starting with the center of interest and I work across the whole uh, surface of the painting and I'll try and bring in touches of uh, each color throughout the whole composition again to tie things together and give some balance and then after I've started to develop my values I'll come in and um, sometimes start to apply a larger wash to try and pull the whole painting together and, and sometimes to create more dominance of one color versus another. And then I'll do some more uh, fine brushwork. Sometimes I'll come in with a rigger and do some linear brushwork that tries to suggest that there's some motion. Um, but that's, that's my approach. So I, I start with a foundation wash, then I build my values, I come in and I do some glazing to try to tie the paint together, and then I continue with some detail work. And sometimes that involves some lifting um, in some areas to to create interest and motion. So these last few shades I've been working on were with a uh, gold to sienna type tone uh, are leafy shapes and I've actually been working more on the positive area of those leaves working within the interior edges to try and one bring them out and make them uh, more believable as a leaf shape but I've also gone behind uh, some lighter leaf shapes which also gives them some credibility and makes it more believable uh, that there's a leaf shape there. I'm working a very dark tone in this area which is um, bringing these shapes forward, these lighter shapes forward 
and uh, it's strengthening my center of interest with a darker values and darker contrast. And don't forget that uh, we've masked some of these linear shapes, which when I remove the the uh, the masking fluid from the paper, those are going to be very white linear shapes, and they're going to uh, suggest branches, but they're also going to have a little bit of flow and motion to them, but they're also going to have a very strong value contrast. So I continue to develop this painting, which is going to take quite a, a little bit of time. So I'm going to use some time-lapse technology here uh, to speed up the process so this isn't uh, so long a video that it's hard to watch. I'm continuing to develop this and I've decided that I want to suggest some green leafy shapes in the, the back of this cluster of leaves and branches. So that's what I'm doing. I'm applying uh, a little bit of a wash and some, some light and dark values of green that gives a suggestion that there's some leaves uh, in the back of uh, these other leaves and it helps distribute this green uh, color across the whole composition gives a little bit more um, balance with that color you can see that um, the purplish reds uh, are more dominant than say the green or the gold they're more subordinate um, so I, I, again, I'm trying to be aware and make sure I do I maintain some sort of color dominance. I've decided that I want to deepen the values up in this upper quadrant of the composition. And I also want to um, make sure that I have color dominance with the, the purple and the, the purplish red colors. So I'm going to work in these areas uh, in the, this top right and around the center of interest with some more of this uh, deeper valued purplish tone. I think one of the things that's important to make a strong painting is that you're aware of the value scale. Sometimes we, we feel that we've got our darkest darks on the paper and really when you look at it down the road it really wasn't so dark or the contrast really wasn't that great. And one of the things that can help is to set yourself up a skill before you start your painting and just put down some tones that are uh, across the whole range of values. Here, your white, your light, your mid-tone, and your darkest dark. You know, put that really dark tone on paper before you start. And then as you're painting and working on your painting, take that uh, value scale you've created and put it to your painting and then ask yourself, have you really gone across the whole range of values and are your darkest darks really that dark? You can have monochromatic paintings or paintings that are all neutral or what some people think of as muddy colors. But if you've used your value scale well, it's still a very strong and attractive painting. It doesn't really matter. I, I feel that having good control of your value scale is more important than the color. I'm not saying that color isn't important, but it's very, very difficult to have a strong painting if you don't have good command of uh, value and value contrast. And talking about what we tend to think of as muddy colors, um, one of the things I haven't mentioned and that you're not seeing because I've edited it out is the use of a hairdryer. I like to keep my, my glazes and my washes fresh and clean. There's initial mingling of color as I put down a foundation wash, but I use a hairdryer quite frequently through my painting process so that I can maintain nice, clean, uh, washes and glazing. So if the paper gets too wet in an area and I know that I'm going to be doing some color changes and if I put a green over top of red 
and they're both kind of fluid and I, I have a good chance of getting a I'll call it a neutral that might not be what I'm after so before I put those colors um, one on top of the other I'll use a hair dryer and I'll make sure that my paper is thoroughly dry so now I'm going to try and give some interest to this upper left quadrant of the paper and what I'm doing is applying uh, some tone back here and I'm using the spray bottle to uh, help give it some direction and it's it's going vertically up and down and it gives the suggestion of a background it gives a suggestion that because of the, the direction and the flow of the paint that it's not part of this cluster of leaves it just gives the suggestion that it's in the back uh, behind all this so remember uh, my reference for this painting was just a handful of leaves that I pulled off a tree in my backyard so this painting I'm developing as, as I go and um, you hear me say the word shape a lot that's how I try to think I try to think in terms of shape so I'm not worried so much whether something's a branch or a leaf or a tree or sky uh, I think of it as shapes and I think of it in terms of dominant shapes dominant colors and subordinate colors and shapes and think of pattern and overlap and and try to create variability but at the same time keeping uh, a dominance with things so now I've reached a point where I want to remove the masking fluid that I applied before I started the painting so this is going to reveal the areas that have been protected below the masking fluid so to do this I'm using a rubber cement pickup eraser the masking fluid is removed and I've decided that I want to make this dark purple shape here uh, more dominant and and build this darker value pattern not just behind that center of interest area make it a little more uh, uh, deeper value but I also want to carry that that value contrast down along that stem and suggest that there's some motion there it helps create a flow through the painting so now I'm bringing in a very dark value and I'm painting around these areas that I masked and by doing so I get a very uh, very dark uh, value contrast Sometimes it starts to feel a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. What I'm doing is trying to create areas of interest. I'm trying to create overlap and suggest that uh, shapes of different values are moving over or under other shapes. So you can see just by those dark tones I put in there, it suggests that there's a lighter linear shape. And where I'm painting right now, um, it's a darker value in it and it's on the exterior edge of that leaf uh, but it's not just an arbitrary um, tone that I put down I've broken that up and, and it suggests again that there's um, an object moving underneath and over another shape so you can see as I fill in that area where I just did or the one I'm doing right now it's uh, I try to create interruption and suggest that there's something going over top or something going under when I do it. So if I'm painting along the, the edge of an object, uh, I intentionally break that edge. Uh, I don't continue along the whole contour. I'll start, I'll, I may contour a shape, but it's going to be interrupted as I go. I'm coming in with some dark linear shapes and as I do it see how I interrupt it and suggest that it's going over top of something or under something else and also just the the fact that it's so linear 
it, it helps gives a suggestion of motion or some flow. So at this point, I'm, I'm really trying to establish direction, flow, give more validity to my center of interest. You can see me working with some very dark values in that upper right quadrant, which is really where I want my center of interest to be. But I will carry those dark values and tones throughout the whole composition to help tie things together. Now I'm taking that same value, that same color, and I'm starting to take it a little further down on the composition and it leads the eye uh, across the paper. But I haven't told the whole story. I'm leaving it to the viewer to make that connection between these values. What helps make it believable is that they're the same value, they're the same color, and then the alignment of the shapes just makes it look like it's a continuation. And the area that I'm working in right now is going to help strengthen uh, the mass shapes that I had. Now that you can really see some of the areas I protected and I'm going to start working around some of those areas to give them uh, greater definition. So the paintings come a long way and I've reached a point where I've decided that I, I really want to give a little bit more dominance to this uh, purplish red tone and also give a suggestion of some larger shapes. So I'm going to come in with a glaze to kind of create that effect, tie things together and um, again help create the suggestion of uh, some larger shapes and some areas for the eyes to rest so the contrast isn't as great. This glaze will take down some of the contrast in areas and it'll help the, some of the shapes, the leafy shapes up front start to stand out a little bit more. This is, uh, again, an area where I like to use this very fine mist spray bottle. It does a very nice job of uh, softening that edge and diffusing that color across the paper. Here I'm going to work with a very dark value. I want to give a little bit more depth in that area in that upper quadrant where is my center of interest and I want to break that shape up a little bit. Some of the shapes are all starting to look a little too much the same size, uh, same value. So um, I'm using this tone here to try and uh, improve that. continue to work with uh, a very dark value here and I want to try and make some of those um, masked uh, branchy shapes that I had a little bit more believable and a little more pronounced so I'm touching along the edges on the exterior edges of those linear shapes with this darker value and it's going to make them stand out that much more so you can see um, how positioning that darker value on the edges uh, just makes them 
be a little bit more pronounced, a little bit more believable. Keep in mind, as uh, I developed this painting, that uh, my reference material was a handful of leaves that I did a sketch with. I'm not looking at anything uh, to, to develop this painting. If you're trying to create a botanical study, then uh, by all means, you take a photograph and sit there in, in a new little way and try and create that accurate representation. But that's not what I'm after. I'm just trying to be a shape maker and try and create a painting working with shapes and negative space and uh, working with different values but the colors are of my own choosing it's not because I'm looking at a photograph and saying that this is the color it should be so I'm uh, relying more on the shapes and the shape making and what's dominant where's my center of interest and where can I create areas of interest and where can I have lost and found edges uh, it's just a different mindset than sitting down saying I want to try and copy this photograph or have a painting that looks like uh, a picture of this house or this landscape. Um, there's nothing wrong with either approach. They're just different. You just have to realize that. So now I'm coming in with uh, some finishing touches and I've got a rigger brush here with a dark value and I'm starting with a purplish uh, dark value and you can see how I break that line up and I go behind other shapes or I go over top of shapes. All that helps create credibility and, and gives validity that something's on top of something or um, a suggestion of some direction and some flow through the painting. This is something that I do often in what I'm doing, say a, a flower or foliage type composition. Um, I just think it helps provide interest and, and helps give some flow to what's going on in the painting. That's my painting, Fall Foliage. I hope you enjoyed the video and got value out of watching this narrated tutorial. Remember, this is a companion video to my demonstration video which is set to music and you can watch the evolution of the painting uninterrupted. Thanks for watching.